right, here we are. How are Hi. you doing, Isabel Casey? Much love to you. How Hello. is life? Great. It's full. It's busy. We just got back from uh, our friend's wedding in Washington, D.C. So that was amazing. It was, a, it was an Afghani Muslim little merger. Beautiful. Um, multiple days. And then we brought the kids. So that was, um, which we travel with them all the time anyways. But this was just, usually we don't have a schedule. And we had a schedule that was not ours that we had to adhere to. So that was... We got tested, <laughs> but it was good though. We all survived. <laughs> good. What kind, what kind of tests? Oh my God. Well, everything from, you know, we, 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 our kids sleep, you know, around kind of certain times of the day, kind of consistently, mm -hmm. you know, not too strict, but pretty consistent, consistently. And that just not really being an option sometimes or trying to get that done in a hotel room with two littles that don't really sleep at the same, the same time, or one decides that they're refusing to because they're two and they can. <laughs> so how, how are you finding it with the, with the extra addition to the family? It's actually, you know what? The ch I feel like the, ch I thought that, I thought the baby would be the challenge, honestly, just, you know, starting from scratch, having, having a newborn and trying to remember all those things. And not that there aren't challenges involved, but I really think it's still managing a toddler, honestly, because, you know, just the dynamic has shifted. I still remember like the day he walked in to the, to the room, like when, <laughs> when Gael was born, I was like, you look like a five-year-old to me. And, and he, and he kind of acted like one. And now even just like the conversations as he's getting older, it's just like every day, like he's just... I don't know, just, he just gets really deep or he's really stern. He's very emotional <laughs> and, yeah. and it's, and it's something, it's trying to figure out how to respond to that without being reactive, which is really hard, especially when you kind of think sometimes, oh, I'm maybe a little bit more evolved than I was before. And then like something happens, like they say no or, or become stubborn. And then you're like, not so much. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Constantly getting humbled. <laughs> yeah, I totally hear you. And Joe and I are constantly just chewing on what, what feels right, you know, and just kind of catching ourselves out if we are being reactive, which we are, sometimes we are, you know, and we, we're like, holy shit, like that was, that was my dad reacting then like the the conditioning from yeah. my childhood and it's it's a total trip to it is a trip to observe that that conditioning and it comes out uh, for me more than anything in in those moments when little soleil just is she, you know it's just part of her growth and development of testing out the boundaries and and part of her growing and I got to remember, holy shit, she's just five, like working it all out. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. whew, it's a, it's a, it's a deep yoga practice. So I'd love for us to really bounce back and forth about like sadhana in the household. Cause to me, yeah. it's really been the deepest practice, you know, of, of communicating with the little yeah. ones and, and yeah. ma maintaining the loving, balance between joe and i and the, the the household sadhana how is it going for you all in all well it's just it's changing so much and it just changed again tony tony travels a lot and so it's kind of me single momming it for the most part during the week and then that's changing because like he's recognizing that just he just needs to be here more even though we do have help we have um our nanny that is here she kind of evolved into our nanny. She's actually right in the next room. Her name's Steph. She's amazing. She like, she's like my shaman spirit animal. Yeah, <laughs> Wise. Steph. On child of her own. But yeah, like we, yeah, we just, we need him here more. And, and I know that I need to be more flexible with supporting his work, but I, we just need that unit there. And so, yeah, it's been that's that's evolving so so he'll be more involved which is really good and 
Um, and then of course, just like life, I don't know. It's, it's like hard for me even to really make a plan for like what we're going to do during the week, like as like with the kids and stuff, besides like minor commitment, we were forced school kind of, it would be the equivalent of socializing puppies in the woods, <laughs> with little kids. So <laughs> playing and exploring and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not too serious, but it's mostly focused on free play and, and just discovery. But besides that, we just kind of wake up and kind of see how the day is going to go. I even, even today, because Pasquale's getting his molars in his like last bit of molars. And so it's just, he's, he's uncomfortable sometimes. And then Gael's of course, you know, about to bud his little two bottom ones. So yeah, it's, um, (laughs) it's been, it's been, it's been interesting. There's been a lot of, a lot of, um, just trying to be really flexible and really patient and then not getting annoyed. And then you, you know how you just said, this is just really a reflection of like how we are in our conditioning. I was just in, when we were in the hotel room, Anderson Cooper, um, who I love, I don't ever get to see because we don't have, but I totally flipped about, um, he was interviewing uh, Howard Stern and they were just talking about that whole thing. Like who we are right now is just a reflection of, it's an expression of that conditioning of us as a little kid. And you see that more, I feel like when you're a parent, you know, it's crazy. It's like, it's different than having a pet. (laughs) Pets are great. They totally prime you for it, but it's not the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) Totally agree. And you are a powerhouse yoga teacher. How have you found being on sabbatical? Is it being, has it been a nice break from teaching or are you craving to be back in that role of teacher? How has it been for you? Long pause that froze up there. <laughs> yeah. the, the wisdom pause. I have no answer, just silence. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I found, let's see, with Pasquale, I remember I didn't, I, I, kept, I kept thinking I wasn't going to have a tough time because I was really excited to not teach. I remember when I finished my last commitment uh, before Pasquale was born pretty early on in the pregnancy because all I wanted to do was just kind of immerse myself in that whole thing. And I had just moved to Boulder, Colorado too, as well. So I wanted to date my environment and I was really good with like, I thought letting go. And then I had him and then I was really, of course, you know, that fourth trimester definitely stepped into that world. And then when I kind of started to look up a little bit, really when I started to add in the physical part of my practice, back in the asana is when I was like, Oh, it like sparked that competitive. Like I want to teach again, or I just want to get out there in some way, you know? And, but I, but I made myself, even though I really wanted that, I made myself not teach just cause it just didn't seem realistic. And, and I don't know, it just didn't even seem like a smart thing to do. It wasn't even worth it to me. Like, I go teach for a couple hours or a couple classes a week and then I'm not with my baby and I really wanted to be. So, and then, and then I think it was a little bit after Pasquale turned a year, I began to teach again and that was great. And I, and it was low commitment. I only had like two classes a week once on the same day, which was really nice. And, you know, just to connect with community. But then when I got pregnant with Gael, I actually, had planned on teaching up until, you know, basically he hatched, but I actually stopped teaching a few months beforehand. I actually, I wanted to, I, I did my, I did a training with my teacher, Rod Stryker. And, and then that was kind of it. I was like, I'm going to peace out for a while and just, you know, do nothing, spend time with Pasquale, wait for this baby to come out and see who he is. And then I'm just still hanging out and, I get tempted, you know, sometimes like that thought crosses my mind and then I'm like, no, no, it's going to be there. And at the end of the day, also too, it's like the one thing that I've always been pretty steady with is, is my home practice anyways. Um, and I have that and that's kind of really all that matters, you know? So so you've continued a home practice. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. And it's totally with Gael, it was definitely tougher. I was able to kind of carve out 
you know, more specific times, definitely in the morning, early, whatever. And, and I'd have support from Tony and I still have that support, but then now there's two children and they don't always sleep at the same time. So I was kind of, you know, just like doing, you know, five minutes here, five minutes there, but then always, always finding a way to take a seat. And most times that would take place in my closet, in my bedroom. <laughs> Cause it was kind of, it was like literally the only place that I could close the door. It's dark. It's sort of soundproof. Um, yeah. And that was it. And that's, I feel like that's the thing that was like the anchor. And then Asana, I would say that steadily and consistently, probably like maybe like six weeks, only six weeks now. And he's, Gael is now seven and a half months old. So I even waited a little bit longer. I just didn't feel ready just like, just, you know, the process of rolling out my mat and like sitting down, I just wasn't ready to do that. So I did other things, you know, walking with the kids and doing those kinds of things and hiking. And Mm -hmm. this winter I was surprised to actually get out and go snowboarding a lot, which was really nice. Um, But yeah. And that's for me is also is very, is a very big part of my yoga practice. It's Mm -hmm. just, I can't describe it. Oh, it is such a beautiful like, feeling. I agree. Probably surfing for you and swimming for you. It's a, mm-hmm. that thing that you can't describe. Yeah. Now that um, moment, that that chapter after first giving birth, I've met quite a few mothers that have had a very strong asana practice, such as power vinyasa or ashtanga or something like that, where they've really struggled with that chapter of recovery, you know, maybe their body is telling them not to practice so vigorously, but that attachment to the practice has become a real struggle for them. And they've found it hard to relax into that period of recovery, which seems quite crucial. And a couple of them, it's really been both depressing that they can't do what they could do and has brought up a lot of anxiety as well. Can you speak to that a bit? Um, speaking to the the mother that has a strong practice, but their body is telling them, just rest, just cuddle your baby, just chill. And they know deep down, yeah, I gotta chill, but they're they're hooked, they're attached to what was, you know? Right. Right. Um, I don't, I know that it's interesting. Well, or let me, let me years earlier. I would definitely have, I would have definitely had some issues mm-hmm. with all of that for sure. And I think only because I feel like I've been get, having my ass handed to me in so many like little spiritual lessons <laughs> just over time. And then just having, the right kind of teachers around me and the right kind of people who are examples like you and Joe, for sure. Like, I think that, um, that's definitely made a huge different, huge difference, but not that it's not that I'm completely removed from that. Um, because one of the motivating factors was to get back in shape. I mean, just to be honest, like I, I like to be, I like to move my body. It feels great. I like to take care of myself. And not from a vain, a vain way, even though I'm sure there's an element of it, obviously. But, um, but yeah, like, I just, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I'm like gliding into my forties and I just, there's a, there's a lot of shifts. I feel like that was, that's huge. Um, I don't think I was, and with Pasquale, with his birth, I had a pretty, you know, like I had a pretty intense birth with him. I had a, an emergency C-section and I planned on delivering naturally at our birth center and I had to get transferred so I had to recover from both and that was brutal I mean I've never I've never had crazy surgery like that in like the main part of my body in my head and in my face for like a another thing but it's just it was just a different experience and I remember having a lot of fear around even like doing like cobra just like lifting my chest because I knew that the front of my body was going to open up and I have like this wound you know like this gash this opening in my body and I can I could feel it really clearly and I I don't know if it was because I was also so aware of that whole thing 
this whole experience that I went through. But it was like a really, just a really ripe, deep scar. And it didn't hurt, but it was just like a reminder, like a human came out that way. And, um, and I was just really mellow, totally different than I've ever practiced before. Even though like my practice over the years has evolved from definitely like kind of typical story, the fiery, the ashtanga, the power of vinyasa, like all of that stuff, fast, a lot, everything upside down. And now I don't do any of that <laughs> at all. And I approached my practice that way, but even just even more mellow. And I think it also helped that I was practicing uh, yoga nidra too. That's a really good kind of like keeping me grounded for sure. Um, and then, um, and then this one, it's weird. It's like, I had a C-section with Gael. It wasn't an emergency. It's just that my body was not delivering because of the shape of my cervix. So we just went, we went that route just because it was kind of the only option or <laughs> possibly death. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. we didn't do that. And my recovery was so much easier and faster. I feel like I didn't even have any, probably a month after I delivered them, which is strange. I don't know why in any kind of way. And then, um, and then, I don't know, I've been just like baby stepping, you know, just like feeling like how far can I actually walk today? How far can I actually hike today? Can I go up this pitch a little bit? You know, and then, you know, you're usually, I'm always packing at least one baby, but it's been just baby steps. And I kind of like it actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, it's nice to go slow in every kind of way, you know, it makes you see things differently. Totally. What a transformation, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely be a hot mess if I had kids 10 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of in vogue as well to, um, to leave it a bit later these days. Huh? <laughs> I know, right. Well, I just wanted, you know, all of my friends started pumping out babies pretty early on and I, right. and I, and I always told started to change a little bit, even though I didn't really tell anybody I did. I was like still <laughs> fronting like, oh, I don't want kids. But I was taking notes. I was watching what they were doing. And now it's amazing because all of them have, you know, children that are, I mean, some of the youngest are like, I think five years old and the oldest are in the, their teenagers driving, going into college. So it's like, so when we were in DC last weekend, how amazing is it that I have all these like veteran parents and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like literally getting all these amazing tips. I got all this cool, these cool strategies to try and That's great. different approaches. It's so great. So yeah, I, I'm definitely, I definitely encourage the wait a little bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get the wisdom cultivated first, then dive in, huh? Actually, yes, for sure. <laughs> and how is mountain life treating you up in Colorado? We're, we're so bummed we didn't get up there, huh? No, I know. It'll happen, but it's, uh, it's, we love it. I just, I love it. You know, we, we get out, we travel a ton. And, and typically when we go and travel a bunch, we go somewhere that's really not like where we live. I and mean, we don't usually go deeper into the woods unless it's like a snowboard vacation or something like that. And, um, and so I don't know, there was something about this trip. Maybe it was because there was a lot of sleep deprivation going on over the five days because of this funky schedule, the time zone change and just all just running around. But I, we all were extremely overstimulated and it was the first time that I actually was thinking this, like I am so overstimulated. I just need to, to chill and just coming home. It's like, I could feel myself settling as we're like driving up the mountain pass. And then it's just, we have, we have no noise pollution, just the noise that we make kids and music. <laughs> and, um, it smells good. It's clean. It's just, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's like, and I, and I actually, and I even said in, your, in my head, I was like, if I see some elk on the way home, all is going to be good. And I literally saw a herd of elk. So I was like, okay, this is a good sign. And then just from that, that point forward, all of our little animal friends shut up the Fox. We have a little Fox that comes by and we give him an egg or two. And then, and then our deer and all that stuff. It's awesome. So that's been fun. And, and you just notice it with the kid, like with Pasquale really, you know, cause he's out and about mm -hmm. and exploring. He's just, this is, 
he's a good traveler, but we, he just, the home is his home. Like that's his base. He's yeah. just, it's familiar. It's, it's, he can go anywhere. There's no, there's really no boundaries except for a fence line. That's pretty far out. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I hear you on that. Uh, as much as we love traveling and as beautiful as this trip has been, it's been diverse in so many different places already. Uh, I see it in Soleil when we've been away for a few weeks. She literally starts to say, I'm, I'm homesick. And we see it in her. Her behavior starts to change. And there, there's really something to being back on home soil. And, and we try to tell her, like, home can be wherever. Home is, like, where the heart is. And there's truth to that. But even seeing it in a, in a young child, yeah, home is where the heart is. But there is something to being on home soil and having a kind of consistency. There, there is beauty to that. And we see, even though we're in beautiful Hawaii right now and life couldn't be really any better we see in her, she's homesick and she's craving Mm -hmm. to get her feet on something familiar and have familiar toys around or whatever, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. She's saying it most days like, oh, I'm I'm homesick. You know, I want to, I want to go back home. Like, ah, this is home. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I, I hear you on that. It's an interesting thing that we're playing with, with all of this travel and homeschool and and being flexible with our lifestyles we we also see that it's not always optimum with with the little ones huh yeah it's hard and it's hard and it's amazing i just i'm always like even though like yesterday on the airplane we we nearly had the experience with them on the airplane was the only difference between that and an exorcism is that their heads didn't spin around. <laughs> oh shit. How bad was it? I mean, there was, there was puke. There was screaming the whole time. Our, I mean, it was crazy. And of course, like the flight was longer sitting on a tarmac with children that one wants to run and the other one just discovered that he can roll and like squirm into everything. That was intense <laughs> were you with tony or were you doing that one solo yeah yeah, yeah. no it was with tony it was with tony and it's just funny because i was just <laughs> laughing because I, I don't know i always like analyze all situations like, all the time and i'm like you know like on the way there into dc we're on a dc flight and on the way home it's lawyers and politicians and some crazy big things and i'm just like oh my god this is either going to create like some birth control policy or (laughs) (laughs) I don't even know. I'm like, everyone is pretty cool, but yeah, it was, that was a long, intense flight. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Joe had a trip solo earlier this year. Um, So three flights all the way from Perth to Maui doing it just herself with the two kids. And she was describing the same thing, just puking, screaming, (laughs) all of it. I don't know how she did that solo, which um, I bow to the parents doing it solo, you know, and you, you can relate uh, doing it solo a lot of the time during the week. And um, I really have such respect. I mean, it's stressful. It's a lot. It is intense, but yeah, it is. And I do, seriously, you guys, because you guys travel and I'm always like, hours, it's only five hours. And you guys always come out the other side. And, well, and I know a, you guys go through that stuff too. Yeah, it's a constant practice, you know. And um, yeah, sometimes Joe's more on her game than I am or or vice versa, but it seems to balance out like we we it's like a constant constant tag team you know she'll she'll be managing the kids or just doing everything and then and then we'll kind of tag team and that that's what works for us is is yeah. i'll be t- i'll be teaching while she's parenting and then she'll be teaching while i'm parenting and and we just keep tag teaming and and sometimes it's yeah. more balanced than other times but for now that is what works for us and, and it's been good it's a good flow and it is a flow it's kind of like i always think that it's like a 
it's like a nice oiled machine orchestra when you have that going on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, n- I could never, I don't even try, but I could never do it by myself. I always tell people I have people who help me. I always ask for help. I always say no, just because it's, this is hard shit. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it's be- <laughs> yeah. And it's become a bit of a cliche saying that you need a village to raise a child, but there's so much truth to that. Like it's very, new for us to move away from our village to move into a new town to to be doing it solo or just with your beloved like it's very new for us so uh, we're just working it out huh right right and it is so true I just like I think of so many of my my friends that are single uh, moms and and some single dads actually that are like either truly single or doing something like me and they don't they do it all and it's amazing and yeah it's it's a, I definitely I definitely like I'm like you too yeah now um interesting stuff's going down in Colorado with the uh decriminalization of psilocybin and um of course, the marijuana thing. Are you observing any changes in the, like, in the communities around Colorado since all of that, or is it just business as usual, life as usual? Well, it's funny. I mean, I think that there are people who are staunchly opposed to it for sure, right? Like opposed to mar- the cannabis and um, and the psilocybin. I don't really hang out with them too much mm-hmm. because a lot of the people that I, I would, yeah, for sure. Cause we've talked about this. All the people that I hang out with kind of don't really care about it. Yeah. It's like all of them partake and some of them do. And either way, it's not, it's not that big of a deal. Um, in terms of like the specific, like, I don't, I think I don't even, Tony would be better for you to ask that too. Cause he like reads up about it. Mm-hmm. He's, been reading all the, you know, the Michael Pollan books and just doing a ton of research and all these kinds of things. Um, and he's really fascinated by it. And I think, and I'm in full support of it personally for um, definitely uh, mental wellness and, and things that they're exploring. I think it's an, a useful tool, but I still haven't really noticed any changes yet because I think that they're still really trying to work out all of the legislation really at federal level and definitely the state level because i know it's illegal in pretty much all almost all the ways not quite sure what part of it is 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 actually fully legal um and then with cannabis i mean it's literally everywhere it's just people smoke it everywhere it's in everything of course then there's the cbd little branch of it too which i definitely am a huge advocate for i think it's amazing healing goodness and and i've seen that myself and i and i have noticed that people are more liberal in conversation because i know that when it was first legalized it still was kind of there was a lot of shame still around it you know like oh pot equals you're a huge stoner that's probably stupid you know not very bright any of that kind of stuff and and it's just not the case at all and if you go into a dispensary it's amazing you see grandmas you see Um, you see the, you know, like definitely the stereotype of what you would expect. If you've seen like something like fast times at Ridgemont high, Jeff Spicoli, greatest movie ever, by the way, Um, (laughs) or one of them. (laughs) And, um, but yeah, like people just talk about it and they just understand that it's, it is medicine. It's medicine. And yes, of course, like with anything, it totally gets abused, but I don't know. I just think people are really understanding the power of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I don't know for me, like when it comes up in conversation and, and if there is anybody who does challenge the benefits, I just have to ask, I just have to bring up alcohol always. I just feel like, you know, alcohol is just so bad on so many so many levels I just I, I don't know that's probably that's a whole different conversation but it's just I really feel strongly about that and um and I just don't feel that way out of things that come straight out of the earth mm-hmm. yeah it is bizarre and insane how that the alcohol thing 
and could even bring in the pharmaceutical thing and the pain medications yeah. and antidepressants that have become acceptable, blatantly insane and just destructive, yet weirdly acceptable. And then the, it's the normal. Uh, normal, it's been normalized. So like in, a, in quite a, sh no, not a short amount of time. It's been in, in our culture and especially in European culture, the alcohol thing for a long time. But in terms of alcohol abuse and yeah, the amount of destruction and illness that it can create so quickly, it, it's just bizarre how, how ignorance has just cloaked that blatant truth, you know, that's undeniable. So it's quite, I mean, in Australia, it's just magnified to another level. Like the, the, the level of alcohol abuse is just, I think, um, worse than in, in America, similar to in the UK. We've probably um, brought that over from the UK. But um, alcohol abuse is just next level. And then the polarization of that is the stigma and how illegal psychedelics are. Like cannabis still incredibly illegal. All psychedelics so illegal. Like got a long way to go in Australia. I mean, even just hemp. Until very recently, even hemp, like edible hemp, was... Uh, pretty much illegal like every wow. hemp product had to say this is for cosmetic use only and you can't eat yeah. this it's just for cos cosmetic and I think it's really just been the last few months that that's been acceptable but it'll still have a uh, a warning label on the product it, it's very interesting right. and um because you go I was I was going to say something sarcastic, but I was like, yeah. maybe we, maybe, maybe your country has the same lobbyists that, as our country. <laughs> well, a very like a Trump lookalike just got um, ele elected as prime minister. He looks like Trump. He had pretty much the identical campaign, uh, just the uh, the Aussie version. I don't think the slogan was "Make Australia Great Again," but pretty much, and like thumbs up and and he's done some really he's, he's brought in some shitty shitty decisions already and yeah it's like he he's a, a cheerleader for for trump and bringing all of that into australia but that's happening in 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 england as well and um yeah it's interesting Everyone. times you know it's actually so i listened you know npr yeah you probably listen to it when you're around here yeah um, so they did a piece and they were talking about how, and I didn't know this. I mean, I knew all the people that they were talking about. I just did, it was, it just wasn't profound until they actually collectively said them one after another, all of these dictators all over the world and counted out how many there were, but I can't remember how many there were, but the number was astronomical. I'll just put it this way. There's, there's more dictators than not running the world that have that agenda. And we're all not paying attention. We're like this on our phone and mm. Facebooking and Instagramming, which is in, which is because I, I definitely believe in the concept of dystopia that, that that's the, the man likes, likes it. Yeah. Like, I just think that it's all designed for us to not pay attention and we really need to look up and pay attention. I mean, we really do. We're just not. And you know, I feel like it, 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 I've listened to quite a few of your podcasts and then I listened to, you know, a few other podcasts out there too. And it's like the same, it's the same theme, like over and over again. Like we're all talking about how <laughs> all this shit is happening. And, um, and then, you know, we're really lucky that we can actually talk about it. I say that kind of in a sarcastic way, but also mm -hmm. too, I mean it, you know, we're, yeah. we're lucky for sure. But then I also, you know, we're fucking entitled, you know, like we sure. can talk about the fact that there's children in cages, but what are we fucking doing about it? I was just talking to Steph about this, our nanny. I was like, right now, while I'm wiping down my baby with a shitty ass diaper, probably sick and separated from their parents and 
no one's fucking doing anything about it. And that is so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is very frustrating. And I think this phone thing, like you just said, is creating this kind of, uh, paralyzed state, this dystopia that you spoke of. And it's so horrific, the situations that are going in the world. It, I, f- I feel it paralyzed me. You know, I feel it mm-hmm. like, what do I do? And then we can all do little things. And like there's, there's this paradox that um, Ram Dass often often chews on as well. And uh, you've probably heard it in one of my podcasts where I'm speaking of Ram Dass when he was in the north of India when catastrophe was hitting Bangladesh and just people dying left, right and center. And he went to Maharaji like, I want to take my bus up there and go and help people, go and save people, be, be a part of the solution. And then Maharaji just gave him a compassionate, wise kind of nod that he was renowned for of like, you could, but don't you see that it's all perfect? And that at first infuriated Ram Dass. Like, how the fuck could this wise saint known for being compassionate and helping everyone. How could he say that thousands of people dying right now is perfect? And that was kind of the the teaching that he chewed on for decades of like the paradox and like how frustrating and infuriating and sad and heartbreaking all this shit that's going on. At the same time, fuck, like, it's perfect. Oh, it, it's such a deep, deep teaching that the mind just can't wrap itself around. And look, staring at our phone and distracting ourselves isn't the solution. Hell no. <laughs> We're getting a tail because of it. We have a tail growing in our spines yeah. over it. That- Speaking about it seems to be part of the solution. Speaking about it, sharing information, uh, this kind of emerging um, activism that is sacred, this sacred activism that, of course, beloved Sean Corn has been a big part of, of spreading the vibes about. And I know you're a big fan of that as well. And Yoga Rupa and Brian Kest, like, there, there seems to be this spreading of a, a, new, a new way, this kind of sacred activism where we're not doing it in the way we used to do activism of just getting fucking angry and going out and yelling about it. It seems through like chewing on these conversations in a, in a new way, for lack of a better word, a new way is birthing this a new potential in which we can hopefully create change and impact truly, like truly uh, beyond, beyond what just one of us can do or a small group. There seems to be a, a big ripple. And I think that is how we can like use the phones in a beautiful way and use the internet in a beautiful way. Like I just spoke with Deva Pramal and Mitan yesterday and they did a global OM project in which half a million people, you know, connecting on the internet, just OMing and, and, and having prayer and contemplating predicaments like what you just brought up, these fucking shit predicaments which I feel helpless over. Like, fuck, I'll, I'll donate and I'll go and do my bit, but is that helping? <laughs> and then... Yeah. Stuff like that where we're creating this huge vibration can seem woo-woo. Like there's a part of me that's like, is that actually helping? Is it us just sitting and fucking alming? <laughs> but then I tune into a deeper like mystical actuality and it's like, yeah, shit like that is helping, you know, as we change ourselves and transform ourselves and have beautiful conversations and 
talk about these shitty predicaments and not just cloak it with ignorance and not just get angry about it, but something much more intelligent. It seems like that could be a part of the shift. I don't know, though. We'll yeah. see. Well, you know, one of the things that I really think, and I'm, and, and I'm not saying, if there's anybody out there that listens to this that is not a parent, please don't take offense to this because I feel like everybody is a parent in some way. Some of my friends are just the most badass aunties and uncles. But cre- raising people, <laughs> I think, is really it. I mean, yeah. to be honest, I mean, yes, cutting a check and, you know, uh, protesting in marches, supporting marches and being informed and surrounding yourselves with all these things, that, that is great too. And yeah, it's, it does feel like you're not really doing much when you, you know, when you're putting a bunch of effort and then you don't really see like these big results at the end. But I just think like the easiest thing is like, you know, raising these little people, you know, with like, as much clarity as you can, you know, I know you're going to, we're all going to fuck up. It's just inevitable. We just will. Um, but just as best as you can. And, and I really think that that will shift things. I'm a good, I'm a good example of it. My dad was a conservative Republican and he birthed somebody who is so not in any kind of way. And, um, And we always had the best conversations. We never got in fights about it. Like we always had great, we always had great stimulating and informative conversations where I was learning a lot too, for the, you know, the reasons why he thought the way that he did and, and same with me, you know, and his generation, my dad was a lot older than most people's parents by at least a decade or more. And, um, and then there was a big gap between us. It's totally, it's like the gap between myself and our kids actually. And, um, and so he was always getting like a little bit of like a, a refresher from like the youth all the time, you know, even if I wasn't even talking about it, he just saw that and he was pretty open to it. And at least even though his ideals and his morals and all that stuff were different than my own, actually, I wouldn't say morals. I'll say the ideals. Um, cause that the root of it all, we were actually really similar. Um, I don't know. It was awesome that he gave me that freedom and and I feel like I'm going to be able to help kind of like, you know, impart that going forward too. And then you, with what you said with it all being perfect, that used to piss me off too. I used to get yeah. so mad and I didn't, and I realized I didn't understand it too. And, and I, and I'm, and I really do believe this, what, what is happening right now with them and we'll use, you know, the president Donald Trump as an example it is perfect that he's, he, he's in that seat only because that's, that's what we've all created collectively. You know, I mean, really, even though I, in every ounce of my being, every little minuscule molecule in my body did not want that collectively, we all did. And I definitely contributed it to it somehow. So it's made me like, take a step back to be like, how did I like, how did I like throw something in the pot? Cause I'm sure he did. How could I not have, mm-hmm. I drive a car. <laughs> we could start there, you know? Yeah. But even deeper though, like the deeper level. And I'm, there's a, there's a suit threat to that, you know? Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And like you touched upon it, cut out a bit. Um, uh, speaking about raising conscious children, but we can spread that anywhere we are. So for for people that aren't aren't parenting, like you said, we've we've all got a parenting role in one way or another, Uh, whether we're yoga teachers or working in a uh, corporate building or sweeping floors or whatever, we can spread these beautiful conversations and vibes everywhere we go. You know, I often speak about one of the the most radiant people I've ever come across is the security guard at the ashram. I don't know if you saw him when you were at the ashram, but 
it, it was so profound. Every time I'd walk past him or nod with him or just have a conversation with him, you know, he was just sitting there guarding, mm-hmm. guarding the ashram, yet he was transmitting this vibration of peace and wisdom and equanimity and clarity. So it really, like, it comes back to, for me, the, one of the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. Like, you want to change the world? Work on yourself, you know? Fucking work on yourself. <laughs> and, and what Jack Cornfield speaks on, like, before we reach out to try to change the world, like, tend, tend to your garden. Tend to the part of the garden that you can touch. And I think that's huge for us, you know? Um, it's so easy to get overwhelmed with these huge world issues. And rightfully so, I think we should. And then bring that into our practice and churn that overwhelm into something, something with much more wisdom and clarity. But then tend to our garden, you know? How are, how's our relationship with our beloved or ourself or our children? And... I think that's just further feeding on what you touched upon. Uh, how are our relationships? How are our kids doing? How, how are we treating our body? How we, how's our home looking, you know? <laughs> and, um, right. and as we create more harmony, as much as we can anyway, in our own direct relationships, it inevitably spreads like you're speaking about with your dad. Same thing I see with my dad, you know? We don't see eye to eye on many different topics, but over the years I've relaxed on my stance with him in a way in which I still own what, whatever I feel to be ideal and we'll butt heads every now and then. But as I find myself relaxing in that relationship, I feel it really be like a microcosm of the macrocosm because there's so much fucking divide in the world right. of left and right. And it's, it's created this extreme left and this extreme right, which really is this extreme pathology that isn't really getting us anywhere. It, it, it's quite interesting. Like the extreme left can be just as bad as the 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 right, you know, it's very interesting. So yeah, just like you shared with your dad, I love to, it's challenging as hell, but to play with finding the relaxation, the clarity in those moments of divide, huh? You've disappeared. (laughs) We'll see if Isabel returns. Hi. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Talk about going on with the flow. Yeah. <laughs> A technical glitch. All right, let's keep rolling and then we'll um and then we'll wrap it up and tend to our children. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Where were we? We I was hot, I was sweaty. Right in it. You're talking about extreme left, extreme right. Yes. And how they're so extreme. Right. Yes, well, um, that's confusing. It's confusing for people. It's an interesting time. And I think it's forcing those of us that are interested to find a deeper a deeper equanimity, a deeper center. I, I really do feel that it's a potent opportunity for that. And I I actually love to kind of play with it with myself rather than creating my own little bubble, which I do. I got to admit, I do create a bubble in my life of people that um, feed my ideals. And of course, that's great. I love that. But I also like to just play with it a bit of talking with people that don't have the same opinion, talking with people like you were sharing with your dad. I do the same thing with my dad, even though it's not an extreme divide. It's one example of 
the divide where we may not have the same opinion, may not even have the same ideal at all, but we can, we can talk and we can get to a even ground of seeing that we're all just trying to, trying to be happy. We're all just trying to work it out, you know? Well, I think also, too, the thing that I'm noticing is the more that you converse with people who aren't like you, and if you, if, if, you know, if both parties can tolerate, you know, going that deep, you find out that you're actually more alike than not. Yes. And, um, and even though we don't have TV, we do, we stream shows. And one of the ones that I started to watch was, I don't know if you've ever watched her. I love her. Sarah Silverman. No. And she did, she, it was a play. It, the show's canceled. I believe it's on Netflix. I can't remember. Hulu. Tony just said Hulu. And, and she, she goes around and she talks to other people who don't agree, who do not have her same opinion. And she all, they all always find out that, they actually have a ton in common. And I just think that that's, that, that's what we'll find out. Yeah. I mean, if, if Donald Trump didn't become our president and like all of these other like people that we don't agree with weren't our president, then we'd be back to all to where we were before where we were actually all hanging out together and tolerating each other. Right. And still having the same, or, or, and still having different opinions and experiences but we would actually get along. Isn't that mm-hmm. weird? <laughs> yeah. That would be the same, you know? So it's interesting, but yeah, it's, it's I just think that as a whole, we just have, we all have a lot of anger, you know, mm-hmm. too, to process and to work through and yes. showing up in all kinds of ways. And then, you know, we get the manifestation of um, leaders who lead us mm-hmm. and it's all of our doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The anger thing. The anger piece with being yogis, I think often the the anger that we experience gets suppressed and denied, and then we put on a a different kind of mask, a yogi mask, a spiritual mask, a positive one. But anger, it's deep in the collective. And once again, in the parenting role, I see whatever anger I haven't dealt with properly and even just subtle aggression, it gets magnified big time. So it's tempting for me to then go, all right, I need to go off to my sanctuary and practice, which is good. It's good to be aware of it and then extricate myself and go and practice. That is good, but I also find kind of doing the tantra in the moment of like, fuck, I'm getting frustrated. I'm getting aggressive. I'm getting angry. I can see it coming up and nabbing it in the bud right there. And then even though it's really challenging, I find it challenging. I feel it. Yeah. It's powerful, you know, just to own it, take a breath, release it. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it's, it's just aggression and anger and I don't release it until I go off and do my actual formalized practice. But it it seems like many of us are getting interested in bringing our yoga into the actual moment, that actual moment that the aggression comes up, that the anger comes up because it's not just us. It's not just our, Stuff. I think what's getting magnified and revealed is it's the stuff. It's our stuff. It's not just Trump stuff and like, and those people over there. It's like, it's here. It's our stuff. And yeah, the whole oneness conversation can be brought into that as well. Like the collective idea, the Trump in each of us, the the suffering yeah, right? <laughs> and it's really challenging to own that you know and um I, as you've probably heard me speak quite a bit of and i think i brought it up at our last retreat of what ramdas does of having trump right there on his puja table and 
God. You know, it's tempting. It, it's tempting for him just to focus on Maharaji and focus on Krishna and Hanuman and the beloved. But then, no, right there is Trump as well, because Trump isn't separate right. to us. Trump is a part of us, and that's part of the predicament we're in right now of of healing that part of us. Right. And it's, it's funny that you brought that up about <laughs> Trump being on his table. I'm, I, God, I wish I could be there yeah. <laughs> at that point where I could do that. Yeah. I'm just not. Which tells me, though, that and just the fact that just I, I, I feel like there was like a pretty good decade or so where I was pretty, I felt like I was, you couldn't really trigger me so easily because I felt like I worked through that, that and then fast forward, you get married, you have kids and just things just shift because life just shifts. Um, and because I'm still dealing with that stuff and learning how to work it out, that's also kind of the reason why I feel like I also shouldn't be teaching right now. Right. You know, I just feel like it would be really hard for me to sit in front of a classroom and I don't even want to use the word advice because that's not what we do. Um, transmit really, you know, just tra- transmit, even if I'm not like articulating how I'm feeling and maybe I'm talking about something else, but that other thing mm-hmm. <laughs> gets sent out, you know? Yeah. And I just don't really feel comfortable about that. It's been, it's the same reason why I don't rush out and go, like, for example, I did my yoga ninja training last year with Rod and, um, I just, I couldn't, I can't wrap my head around like instantly being like, sweet, I got my nidra certificate piece. I'm going to go teach yoga nidra until my head falls off. I just don't think that that's how it should go. I think that you have to have some time to digest it all and like really have some integrity around where you are with it. And I just don't think that I'm ready in a lot of different ways right now to like be sitting in that capacity, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I do know. And I, I think that's really honorable to be honest with that. I think that's a beautiful thing to be honest with that. And, um, and I think a lot of teachers listening to that, because you, you've been teaching yoga for quite a while, I think a lot of teachers listening to that could also relate because it, it seems like, with younger teachers, there's a kind of, there's a freshness and there's an enthusiasm, which is beautiful to just go out and teach and spread that, that fresh wisdom. But then I think there's another like wave of studentship, which I think you're speaking of. And of course you're deep in the role of being a mother and that, that would be a part of it as well, I'm sure. But I think with teachers in general, there's, a, there's an, another wave that comes in of, of that kind of honesty that you're speaking of, of really being deeply honest with how powerful that role is of being a teacher, you know, and, and honoring, honoring, right. honoring the teachings that are coming through and honoring your teachers as well. Um, at the same time, I'd love to also just share how beautiful it is just teaching from that place of, of, of humanness and, and authenticity and of just sharing, sharing of the human experience and the, um, and yeah, the, the humility, because I think that's where a lot of people can learn as well, of just sharing of, of what you're going through, of balancing being a teacher with being a mother, with being a seeker, with all of these different roles that you're percolating. At the same time, none of it is you, you know? So I think there's valuable teachings right. even just in that, that it doesn't have to be like right. how Rod Stryker does it and it doesn't have to be how other master right. teachers do it. But how does a mother do it that's juggling having two kids and being in the mountains and, and not, not feeling fully confident to teach? Like, how does it, 
come across from that authenticity. And I think there's value in that as well, big time, you know? Right. I feel like when I, when I went back to teaching after I had Pasquale, um, one of the things that I, that I was really good at was saying I didn't know. Right. And I didn't know something. Yeah. And, um, and it's not that I wasn't doing that before, but I definitely wasn't doing it, it as often. That's for sure. And I, um, and it actually was really liberating to, to say that, yeah. you know, and, and I think I, and I think I probably say it more because now I have like little kids that I don't want to walk around trying to act like I know everything because I don't. <laughs> and I don't want them to think I do. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather them watch me work it out and like figure out how to do something and ask questions and model that versus then be, you know, like a, a totally functioning from that side of the ego and being like, yeah, well, this is how it's done. And there's only one way Mm -hmm. and no to everything else, you know? Yeah. It just doesn't work. Well, that I'm finding it doesn't work. And when it blows up in your face. (laughs) Totally. Oh yeah. And it's really refreshing actually hearing that the, the wisdom of not knowing we don't, none of us fucking know anything. (laughs) We don't know anything. Um, And this trip of spiritual arrogance, I think, is kind of, I think, I think there's divide in that as well. Uh, I think there's a lot of spiritual arrogance in the world right now of my method is the fucking method. At at the same time, a lot of uh, humility and, and deepening, such as what you're sharing of, I don't fucking know anything and it's okay, you know, (laughs) but it seems, (laughs) it seems most teachers do go through at least a phase of, yeah, I know it. I fucking know it. And, And that kind of arrogance, but I think it's a beautiful next wave of like what you were speaking of, of, of deepening, our studentship and really, really listening to the elders and then the, the wisdom keepers, you know, and, and that next movement of studentship is so, I cherish it deeply. I feel like I'm in that as well. And yeah. And I feel like that's really where it's at. I feel mm-hmm. like that's where we'll get a lot of answers. It's just that, and it's going back to, um, just what we were talking about. You just, you have to, you have to experience it. You actually have to go into it. Mm -hmm. Like you just, you just, nobody else can do that for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got to ride each wave, huh? I don't know. Right. And I'm really, I am glad that, you know, more and more people are doing, you know, some form of yoga, even though some of it isn't very recognizable, but they're drinking some sort of spiritual Kool-Aid, which is making them think a little bit differently. Maybe it's not like working it all out, like, you know, vanity or whatever, just those little things. But there's some element of it that is seeping into just seeping across all cultures and all like types of business. Um, And it's just maybe not called, called that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just, I think that there is going to be a shift yeah. you know, in consciousness through that. Yeah, I, I agree. I've, I've found myself over the last few months kind of relaxing on my stance of what, what yoga is and what yoga isn't, you know? And I found I was just starting to catch, catch myself out being a bit too judgmental of all these uh, neo, neo-yoga kind of... Um, you know, as Rod Stryker would put it, like making stuff up yoga or making stuff up tantra, all of these new right. new modes of yoga where a lot of a lot of these younger teachers don't even have a teacher. And I was finding myself just being um, ju- very judgmental of that. And then just through having conversations with some of these younger teachers and really hearing where they're at, I was finding, yeah, there, there's a lot of beauty happening there and there's actually a lot of wisdom and it's coming in different forms and different 
sizes and shapes. And yes, they're, they're enjoying some beer yoga and some goat yoga and hip hop yoga. And, um, but that's okay. They're, they're actually getting somewhat empowered through it and they're feeling more confident through it and they're feeling more truth coming through in their voice and that's just part of their trip. So I did find after really just right. hearing them out and relaxing on my stance of, nah, that's not fucking yoga. Um, right. That has been a part of me not knowing as well. <laughs> right. And also too, isn't it interesting how all that stuff, even though like I'm not a any of that stuff, any of, any of the, I don't know, any of the distractions. Yeah. Um, but God, it's funny how you can see yourself. That the reason why it pisses us off is because there's something in it that we see yeah. ourselves, and even whether we want it, whether we want to admit it or not. Like yeah. it's just, it is. Even if you can't like put a label on it, mm -hmm. it's just so interesting. I always think about that. I'm just like, eh. the only reason you can recognize it is because you probably did that shit at some point in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And also too. I don't know about you, but the older I get, I don't know. I mean, even though I totally, I'm not going to act like I, I definitely don't like let things slip and like roll my eyes or whatever. But I don't know. I just, it's like you just kind of don't care anymore. It's kind yeah. of like um, <laughs> the stereotype of an old person, you know, <laughs> at the beginning of being old, they're just, they're, they're like, all right, I'm cool. And then maybe they start to do some like deeper self-discovery work. I see this all the time with people, like, especially like in their sixties mm -hmm. and then, um, and then they get to their seventies and then they adopt to the, I don't give a fuck attitude. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Know? And like, things don't bother them. You're are they're already who they are. That's it. They're just waiting for the next thing. And it just, they don't, I just feel like they don't really waste their time too much on <laughs> other things. Mm -hmm that you do when you're younger, you know? Right. Yeah. We love to, but I am, I am. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, I but I am curious in doing that work because, you know, Rod said something in a training that I love and I always think about it. Um, and I can't remember the training and I can't remember the complete context, but the thing that he said was, paraphrasing especially if he's listening <laughs> um if you don't change your ways by the by the time that you're 50 good luck <laughs> you know yeah kind of motivation to keep keep on going keep on going isabel it's been so beautiful connecting with you our our connection hasn't been great but i still feel our deeper connection has been beautiful and I love your radiance and your wisdom that you shine so honestly and freely and beautiful. And it's really, I really cherish our, our relationship and I feel many parallels and many life lessons just being mirrored from you. So it's a real honor to connect with you and share you with the listeners Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I appreciate it. It's a huge honor. Um, and, you know, any anything that you do, I love. You and Joe, you guys are amazing people and definitely people that I look up to. So to actually be able to, like, have, like, this carved out time to, like, hang out with my brother is extremely special. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Much love to you, Isabel. Please send my love to your beautiful family. And I hope to I come will. and join you up in the mountains sooner than later. Yes, anytime. All right. Much love, Isabel. Till next time. All right. Bye. See you. All right. Bye.